That is God's desire for us. When he was speaking to the children of Israel, before they were getting ready to enter the promised land, he, he begins to share some blessings that he wants to just pour out upon them. And I truly believe, I, I, I've told you this, and I've shared this with you, I believe those blessings are for us today because the Bible declares that the true children of Abraham are who? The children of faith. Those who believe in God, those are the true children of Abraham. So God was making these promises to who? To the children of Abraham. That's why I believe a lot of these promises, we can grab a hold of them because us who are of faith, we are the wild olive branch that was grafted into the natural tree. And this is God's work. We can't take any credit for it. It's Him doing it. It's only because of our faith in Jesus Christ can we stand where we are. Can we say that we have forgiveness? Can we have the hope of eternal life? But God, when He was talking to the children of Israel, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, which we were using, verse 19 is our main preface as we started the first message on this. And this is what it says, verses 19 and 20, just as a recap this morning. He says, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to, to witness the choice you make. And, he listened, and this is what we focused on that first Sunday. All that you would choose life. See, that is God's desire for His people. God's desire for His people is that we would choose life. He says, so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourselves firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. Again, He, he, he wants you to choose life, but He also tells us, how can we maintain this life? How can we grab a hold of it? How can we possess it? He tells us that in verse 20. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God promises a blessing upon us. If you remember, I think it's in Deuteronomy 28, it talks about how God literally says He guarantees this blessing. So you know, when He's telling us to trust in Him, when He's telling us to love Him and obey Him, and to choose the life that He's offering, there truly is no downside to that. But it's amazing. It's amazing. And I, I was just sharing this with someone earlier. It's amazing how the devil is so good at getting us distracted off of the goodness of who God is. How he's good at getting us to be concerned with the affairs of this life, the concerns of this life about other things, and, and truly get our minds off track off of what God would have us to be and do and live. But what we talked about is how God's desire is for us to choose life. And then we, we, we got into the next message and said, you know, okay, life is now chosen. What's next? What do we do after we choose life? Colossians 3, we ministered on this. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2 says, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sight on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on the earth. And we said, we talked about what's next. It's about truly realizing heaven's our home. We're only strangers and foreigners in this world down here. We, we live down here, but this is not our home. Once we ask Jesus Christ into our hearts and our lives, our true home is where? It's in heaven. Heaven is the, is the place where God dwells. And our true home is with Him. And we're to keep our minds and realize. And to see, that's one way we can really battle the devil. We realize when He comes against us, we need to realize that there is something greater awaiting us. And that is found in the life that He has promised us. And we need to hold on to that. And that's what will give us the strength to make us through almost any situation we go through when we realize Amen. our final destination is with Him. Our final destination is truly heaven. See? It's just not every good person gets into heaven. It's only the redeemed that get into heaven. It's only the forgiven that get into heaven. So we talked about what was next and what this type of life should have looked like. And then last week we looked at life. Live like there's no tomorrow. And in all my years of ministry, like I said, I'm pretty sure I never preached on that portion of Scripture. It's Peter walking on the Lord. I've talked about it. I've read it and all this stuff. But I never ever minister a message on Peter walking on the water. And we use that to talk about what a radical faith that Peter had stepping in. I mean, just really think about it. Him, him, him stepping in. He says, Lord, can I come out to you? And Jesus walked on the water. He says, come on. Now, first off, like I said, if he was to tell you that, what would you do? 
Oh, I'm good. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope I didn't have the faith to step out. But, 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 if, but if we did, we stepped out. Imagine what it was really like just truly standing on top of water. And what, man, what a cool thing. Yeah, he sank, but guess what? Jesus picked him up and walked back on the water and took him Right? We, we talked all about that last week. But, but we use it to talk about a, living a radical faith for him. We realize as long as we keep our eyes upon Jesus, no matter what kind of storm may come our way, no matter how the, the, the devil may try to rise up and cause problems, as long as our eyes stay focused on him, we can stay on top of that water with him and, and live a radically, a radically life living faith in him. And it all comes, again, it all centers around him. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. This week, we're going to look at life again. Like I said, today is Palm Sunday. This is the day that the Jewish people, as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, the first, you know, it's the first, you know, we call it Palm Sunday, but really the, the first thing he did was the Bible said he took off the garments and they laid them on the ground. In other words, it, it, it was a, it, you, that was something of value. They took it and they laid it on the ground for Jesus riding on the donkey he was riding on to ride upon him. Then when he ran out of those, he said they went and what, cut down palm branches and laid them in the way. And they began to utter these words, Baruch Haba, Bashem, Adonai. They began to utter the words, Baruch Haba, Bashem, Adonai. They were saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what I'm looking at this being Palm Sunday, I'm going to look at he came, but why did he come? He came to bring life. He came to reiterate, to emphasize what the Father spoke to the children of Israel when he says, Choose you this day. He came to declare life. Blessed is he who comes. But why? Like I said, why? Why did Jesus come? Like I said, the answer is life. Today, at the start of the message, I want to look at a portion of Scripture in John chapter 10, and it's verse 10. This may be a very familiar portion of Scripture to us. And I might say a few things about the first part of the verse, but my main focus is going to be on the second part of the verse. John 10, 10 simply says, and this is Jesus talking, He says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying what? Life. He came to give us life. Like I said, He came to reiterate what the Father's desire is for people. Because when Adam and Eve walked away from the, 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 the perfection that God gave them from the beginning, it was always God's intention to restore them. And you need to I've said this before. God was not caught off guard when Adam and Eve sinned. He wasn't up in heaven scratching his head saying, Oh boy, what am I going to do now? It did not catch him off guard. Because we know that Peter, he, Peter later stated in one of his epistles, he says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb that was what? Slain from the foundation of the world. And how do you know the foundation had to be laid before Adam and Eve were made? So before Adam and Eve were made, God already made up his mind that Jesus, the Son, was going to come down and die because he already knew that Adam and Eve were going to falter and fail and slip up and mess up. But his ultimate goal was, he says, I'm going to restore life to them. I'm going to give them an opportunity to have the life that I desire for them, the desire I have for this life. And I'm going to give them that opportunity. I'm going to give it to them through this one named Jesus, through my one and only Son. And Jesus, as he was talking to this multitude, he says, my purpose, my purpose is to give them a rich 
and satisfying life. And again, but I just want to jump to the first part of that verse real quick. Like I said, the devil's very good at what he does. He's very good at being a deceiver. And all so much he's good at getting our eyes off of the goodness of God. He, 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 I mean, like how he did with that enemy. He's always trying to tell us, look what God's withholding from you. Look at this great thing that, that God does not want you to have. And the Bible does tell us that sin is pleasurable. It's, it's great for a season. See, God talks about eternity. The devil can only talk about a season. And as we know, seasons change, but eternity does not. And the thief, which is referring to the devil here, it says what well, it's his purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And you need to understand that the devil is not your friend. He is not your friend. His sole purpose, his sole desire is to see you end up lost in eternity in a lake of fire, separated forever from God. That is his desire. But again, you know, Christ tells us that. He, he reminds the world. He's saying, look, you know, the devil's not your friend. He says, but my purpose, my purpose, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. In John 14, 5, Jesus tells us, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one can come to the Father except through me. Not only is, the, is he the life, he's the truth. And he's the way. And so again, it all points to him. It all points to Jesus. It's all about him. And as long as we keep our eyes upon him, life will be ours and we can grab a hold of it and live it in a radical way. You notice how all these things are beginning to tie together. And yet how it all ties together in who? It all ties together in Jesus. John 1, verses 1 through 4 tells us this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. I want you to understand that. I get amazed at how many people, even in, the, even in the church, don't realize that Jesus did not just come into existence when He was born as a baby. He existed before He was a baby in the manger. We know that, right? If you didn't know that, well, you need to know that. That's what John 1 is telling us here. That, 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 that Jesus... He's God. He existed with the Father from the beginning. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And His life brought light to everyone. So again, He gets back to what He was talking about in John 10.10. 10. His purpose is to do what? To bring life. To give us an abundant life. To give us a rich and a satisfying life. That's why Jesus came. He came to give us life. But why did he come to give us life? Because there was a problem that we had. Luke 19.10 tells us, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were Law. See, we, we walked away, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, we walked away from the life that God had within this life that, that, that He wants us to have. And He reshowed it again to Israel by saying, Choose life. All that you would choose life that you may live. We have so many times, we, we as mankind, we, I'm going to use this term very, we, we act so stupid. It's amazing how we do things that are so self destructive. Classic example of it is look at this stomach of mine. I know I should not eat what I eat, but I eat, I've been trying to change some things up here in the past little while. But you know, when the day comes, if by some chance of all of a sudden I develop diabetes, that's not God's fault. That's my own stupid fault. Because I'm the dingling who decided to, to, to eat all the potato chips, the candy bars, the, 
Peter Bowes writes, we can't get that into this. That's, that, that's a God for you. It, it may have been the fruit that was on the tree in the garden. Lord, don't kill me right now, please. But I'm the one who decided to have the destructive diet. I will say, you know, of course, what, what didn't help matters was when I was starting to pick up weight and I went and had a physical and I was overweight and the doctor comes in after he does a full physical workup on me. He says, Mr. Shorty, I want to tell you, you're pretty healthy for a fat guy. That's what it was. Blood pressure's normal, cholesterol's normal, all that kind of stuff. You know, and I said, okay, well, why should I change what I'm doing? <laughs> but I also, like I said, also know that whatever the results are, what I chose to do, it is my fault. I know what I should do. How many of us, many times, you know what we should do? Lord, I know I shouldn't eat that payday. <laughs> now, nah, I'll, I'll, I'll come here, payday. <laughs> <laughs> we know what we shouldn't do. But that's right, we do it. It's always something that we And yet, you know, we, we, we choose sometimes such a self destruction. And Christ came in this verse tells us. He came to seek and save those who were lost. He came to grab a hold of them and say, hey, there is a better life than what you live. There, 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 there is a purpose you can have which truly is a great and awesome purpose and it's found in there. You don't have to keep on living the life that you're living. There's a greater life that can be found. I mean, so when he, he came to bring us like, because why? We were lost. We needed him. Now Luke 5, verses 31 through 32 tells us, Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think, I love how he says it, who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. And, and here's the thing, every single one of us that's under the sound of my voice this morning, if you are a, a child of God, if you are one who who, who claims to be a Christian, you've had to got to the point where he said in that last part, you know that you're sick. You know that you're lost. You know that you're a sinner. And you needed to repent. You needed to call out to that one and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. He came, he came to bring life. See, Jesus' whole purpose was, is, and always will be to bring life to those who need it. And we are all in desperate need of life. In this life that he came to bring. My <coughs> Jesus hit it too early. Jesus did not come to tell you how messed up and how bad you are because he already knew that. He came. To bring you life. I was I just recently saw a post of someone on, on Facebook and something they put on there. And it made me begin to think that sometimes we need to be careful as Christians that we don't begin to point fingers too much. And how you know there, there, there's people who sit there and say, you know, uh, you know, Jesus got on people. You know, he, he, he declared real heavy about the kingdom of heaven. But you know, the only people that Jesus ever really, I'm going to use the term yelled at, or got down on, or criticized, do you know who it was? It was the religious. Those, if you're in this place this morning, if you're lost, if you don't know this one, this person we're talking about Jesus Christ, he didn't come to tell you that you're bad, that you're awful. He came to tell you, I'm offering you life. And I'm offering you something that, that, that is great and awesome. Because you already know, more like you already know how messed up your life is. He comes to bring you hope. He comes to bring you a future. He came to bring you life. 
But to those of us, if we think that, that we've arrived, I'm here to tell you, you better be careful because you're about to fall. Because he, he will get on the religious. He will get on the self-righteous. Because like I said, I didn't come to save those who think they're righteous. But he came to bring life. I'm asking our musician come. I knew this wasn't going to be a super, super long, long message today. But I want to close it with the verse that we've been closing all of these messages with. Because again, it's the key, this life that he's offering us. And I have down here this question. How do we choose this life? First, and this has to be the first step by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then it's what the writer Hebrews shares in Hebrews chapter 12. And I, 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 we talked about this over the last several weeks. The key to grabbing hold of this life and maintaining it. The key to having a successful walk with the Lord is found in these verses. I thought about this this morning, but I didn't go grab them. I, I was going to go bring a ton of suitcases in here this morning and use them as we talked about this verse. So I just want you to sort of visualize with me this morning. I'm holding, just imagine me holding all of this, this stuff in my hands and in my arms. And, and here in Hebrews it says, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, see, that we, we can learn by those who have gone before. There are so many accounts in the Bible. I'm sure God has placed other people in your life who have been a faithful child of God that you can see, look what God has done. Where you can look at that, there are witness of this life of faith. And it says, and let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Like I said, just imagine this morning that I'm carrying all this luggage, or I'm, I'm carrying a bunch of weight. Imagine if I was getting ready to run a race and I grabbed a backpack. I know Andrew came in came with one this morning, didn't you? Didn't you come with a backpack this morning? Oh, you're not more than I thought somebody I saw something go last night. But imagine, I grabbed the backpack and I put it on, and I, and I had it filled up with rocks in the back of it. And I'm getting ready to run a race. And the person beside me is a lean, mean running machine. First off, they lean the running machine by myself. You'd say, oh, oh, you're in trouble. And the race started and begins to take off. Because he isn't weighed down, odds are, he would take weight. Again, I can say, well, here is my love here, shoot. <laughs> but it truly goes to show that God says, and we're, we're, we're going to strip off the stuff that holds us back. Like I said, too many times, and I was talking, and I, I mentioned this the other way too, how we hold on to that stuff because it's the familiar. We go to it because even though we know it's not good for us, it's the familiar. So we seem to gravitate towards us, toward it, even though it may be destructive to us. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, says, look, you know, others have made, they've been successful, so you need to strip this thing off. You need to let it go. See, we need to get to a point where we learn to be able to let it go. To truly leave it behind because the only thing it will do is hinder us in our relationship with God. The only thing it will do is hinder us in our walk with Him. We need to let it go. And then it says, let us run with endurance. Let us run with, with a tenacity. Let us run with, 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 with a goal and purpose. The race that is before us. See, it has to be an intent, an intentional run. Not just something that's ha has it all. You know, whatever. Which way is the wind going? Okay, I'll go this way. Uh -oh, I'll go this way. But it's running with intentionality. Running intentionally. In a particular way. 
Jesus, the start and the finish of my faith. 